I, what else can I say? It's just sort of a random fun fact. I work with athletes, so I'm around them a lot, and uh, keeps me young, and it reminds me how non- uh, uh, limber I am now and how uh, harder it is to heal at my age. It's amazing to watch the healing powers of the young folks. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> um, I know it's a little different to hear from someone you don't always necessarily know, but it's a real honor for me to, to meet new brothers and sisters in Christ for me and folks that are larger, part of the larger kingdom of God and to share things. Uh, I thought today we could look at a story of two young persons who are both flawed in a little way. Their parent treats each of them the same, but they act differently. And so that will serve as the point of interest and tension uh, in our story. Uh, it's just a short parable. Uh, I like it partly because it's short, partly because there's not a lot of details to keep track of, uh, not a lot of references or things to remember that from elsewhere in scripture. It is not the parable of the two sons that you're probably most familiar with, the, the prodigal and the elder. That's the most famous one. This is the other one. This one's about one-tenth as long uh, as that particular story, too. Another thing I like about it is it's aimed at religious leaders. Maybe that interests me, because as someone who's trying to do that, maybe I feel like it, it aims at me. The characters are young adults. Maybe that interests me, because I spend so much time with young adults. Uh, and I think it really, over the years, has given me a sense that this kind of describes the faith journey uh, for a lot of people. It happens to be a parable that Jesus interprets. He doesn't do that very often. Usually he just lets the parable land, but this is one that he actually interprets. So that's, that's also fun. Um, I will warn you, uh, it's a parable with a little bit of a, a little bit of kind of a slap on the wrist uh, for, for believers or a little bit of a kind of a shaking of your shoulders, you know. Uh, the parables that come right after it are much harder. So I picked the mildest of the three, but there is a little bit of a push in this one. The one that comes right after this one is the parable of the wicked tenants, which is like a bucket of cold water on your head. Uh, and then the one after that is, uh, thank you, is the parable of the wedding banquet, which would be very much like a punch to the gut. <laughs> uh, those are really aggressive parables. Not so much, but it's still, it's still one that's going to push on us uh, a little bit. And so I just warn you for that. Shareable parables. That's what you guys are doing. Stories that have these meanings. I hope you know that the word parable, parabole, para, alongside, bole, throne, means to throw two things alongside each other. And what Jesus is doing is he throws spiritual truth into this really normal story. And so that's what parables are. They're a throwing alongside of, you know, sort of heavenly biblical truths in just a regular, ordinary, made-up story. It's just a made-up story that he's telling for people to understand. Um, the other thing I would say is... Uh, that in the parable, this one, there will be a reference to the vineyard. Uh, it be the last thing you probably need to know before we get into it. A vineyard for the Jewish people was a symbol of the kingdom of God, the kingdom, the kingly rule of God in the lives of God's people. So that idea of the kingdom is going to be in, in here a little bit too. And it's going to be about belief and changing of our minds and repenting. Uh, and it's really short. Here it goes. This would be Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21 it's told during the last week of Jesus' life. So this is right around Palm Sunday, right around the turning of the temples, the tables in the temple, right around a lot of pressure on Jesus. It is a pressure-packed time, and Jesus is pushing back with some of these parables. So just know that. We're in a fairly uh, you know, tense little stretch. Here it is. Matthew 21, 28. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first son and said, My son... Go work in the vineyard today. This son answered, I don't want to. Some translations are a lot more aggressive here. I will not. It's a pretty strong negative. But later, he changed his mind and went. Then the man went to the other son and said the same thing. Oh, I will, sir, he answered. But he did not go. Which of the two sons did his father's will. They, meaning the religious leaders who he's talking to, said the first. Then Jesus said to them, truly or verily or soberly, I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you or ahead of you. For John, referring to John the Baptist, we'll say something about him in a bit, came to you in the way of repent righteousness or showing you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. But you, when you saw it, 
didn't even change your minds then and believe him. So that's it. That's your story. Nothing particularly long. Um, I want to sort of personalize it and hopefully drag you into the story a little bit. And I will overdo it. So just understand that. I'm trying to pull you into the story here a little bit. So assignments are being handed out at the beginning of the day. I'm going to make up a time, 7 a.m. breakfast. I made that up. It's not in the story. But assignments are being handed out at the beginning of the day. And the father asks this first son to go work in the vineyard. And the son says, no. And you're like, what is his deal? Well, let me help you. Let me help you maybe possibly imagine what that's like. Son, I want you to go work today in the vineyard. Oh, uh, not going to happen. <laughs> I am sick and so tired of this sorry vineyard. I would like to make some of my own plans. I'm tired of missing out on my, all my fun. I'm tired of everybody telling me what to do. I can perfectly well plan my day Dad. It's not going to happen. There will be no vineyard activity for me. And then I can imagine him sort of firing off some kind of tweet about my parents are clueless and life is unfair. And it's very likely that would get consistently retweeted by his friends, and there would probably be hashtags in there about how, you know, question authority, or get a life, or, you know, taken for granted, and I'm sure there was a whole bunch of eye roll emojis, eyeball eye roll emojis in there. I mean, I could just imagine this whole thing playing out, right? Now, I do like his honesty. I, that, that's commendable. He, he's a straight shooter. Uh, Pastor Earl Palmer says this boy, this first boy, is a big problem at breakfast, but he's actually a joy at dinner. He's the one who stirs everybody up. The parents are like, oh my gosh, what's going on with him? What is his problem? He's the contrarian. So then we have a second son, the one who says, absolutely, I'm in, 100%. Count me in. Uh, so this one is a little different story here because it doesn't happen. And your question there is like, what went wrong with you? Uh, I'll take another try at this. Son, I want you to go work today in the vineyard. Oh, Dad, absolutely. I am so glad you asked. I'm looking forward to working in the vineyard today. 100% that I'll be on board. I am going to do an excellent job in the vineyard for you today. In fact, very few people are going to work as hard. I probably will eat a little extra breakfast so I can just work right through lunch. I'm going to be first team all vineyard by the end of the day, Dad. Count on me. I'm the one. Or, or it's possible that this son just did the polite yes. You know that one? You just kind of say yes because that's pretty much what you think they want to hear. <laughs> and so it's easier to say that and just sort of ride its path of least resistance and not really stir that. It's kind of a yes, but you never really intended to go. That's a possibility, too. It's also a possibility that he thought no one would ever check up. I'm just, no one's going to know. It's also a possibility that he did want to go. He's just one of those guys that doesn't quite know how to finish things. You know, just doesn't quite have the stick to He meant well. He's aware. You know what I mean? Sometimes that happens. You're just not quite able to follow through and actually execute on the things you were hoping to execute on. Every one of those is a possibility. Jesus does not give us the reason, which is partly why I think I like this story, because I can fill in a bunch of different reasons. You could probably think of some others, uh, too. But the fact that he says no at the end, that he somehow gets to a no, actually ends up being the pivot point in, in, our, in our whole story here. So I'm thrilled, as a person who lives in the 21st century, that these were only first century problems. I love the fact that nobody today makes promises they don't follow through on. I love the fact that today nobody makes false resolutions. Nobody misleads anybody. Nobody goes overboard just to try to get your... No one does that today, and it is so great. So I work with college students. First of every year, we always have an activities club sign up. I can tell you 30% of the people who put their name on that list... I will not ever see again. Some I'll see for a little while, but some won't. There'll be another group that when maybe a parent is in town, decides that they want to come out to our study or a worship thing that we're doing, and I'm thrilled they came. I hope they'll come again. But I can pretty much tell they're here because their mom or dad thought this would be a good thing to do, and so let's just keep the, let's just go. We'll just, we'll just sort of go and do that. 
Or maybe they really do want to take God seriously later in life. They're just not interested in, in that now. Or, and this is where our parable pinches us, maybe they saw someone in the room who wasn't their favorite, and they're not thrilled about that. Um, I, I don't know. But I do know that I'm interested in using the Bible to talk with people I'm working with, with you, to myself, about things that actually are in our lives, not just things that first century people had and the story is not. I'm actually talking about what is going on. How does this happen? What takes place when we overdo the yes or underdo the no? I mean, how, how, does, how does that go down? So can you tell which of the two mindsets that Jesus sort of wanted the religious leaders to identify with? Um, it's a good question. That's not that simple, actually. And then I'm also curious, which, which of the two do you identify? Which are the ones you more likely to sort of veer off course uh, with? So the story says that it was the relig religious leaders Jesus is talking to. And he's trying to get them to come on board with his kingdom agenda, with his desire to do the kingdom his way. And so he references this person named John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the opening act for Jesus. John the Baptist is the one who comes on the scene, and Scripture says he's a voice crying in the wilderness. He is, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for God. There's someone coming you need to pay attention to. John is sort of that spokesperson, the messenger, crying that out. And he's a bit of an odd dude. He's kind of out in the desert. It says he eats some unusual food. I won't go into that. Uh, and he wears different kinds of clothing. He's like this Elijah out in the desert figure that people don't quite know what to make of. Uh, but he has a lot of influence, it seems like, with the people. And one day, one day, Jesus shows up and says, John, I want you to baptize me. Hence, he's John the baptizer. But he also baptized a lot of other people. Uh, and John's like, no, no, no. That's not how this goes, Jesus. You, you the one who does it. And Jesus says, no. No, in order to fulfill all righteousness, I want to follow through and be obedient to baptism. I just referenced that because we're talking about baptism and Lord's Supper. Those are two interesting things in the scripture that, that seem to have an ongoing significance for us today. But he tells him, so he baptized, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And soon after that, you'll start seeing John the Baptist pushing his own disciples toward Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. Andrew and several, it's mentioned, he pushes them. There's one coming who's greater than me. This person who's, you know, the thongs of their sandals or their little, I'm not worthy to untie them is how he talks. Like, this guy's the big deal. This is the person coming. You need to go with him, not me. And ultimately, John pushes back against one of the leaders, Herod, and he is beheaded. So John has a rough end. That has all happened by here. And Jesus' shorthand description of the ministry of John the Baptist is very simply, John was a person who came to show you the way of rightness, righteousness which is right relatedness to God, right relatedness to people. That was John, that's Jesus' shorthand version here. But here's the rub. The people who were responding were tax collectors and sinners. There were unexpected folks with questionable jobs, objectionable morals, maybe not the ones that they were expecting to respond. These are the people who were responding. And so Jesus is saying, come on, religious leaders, you got to get on board with this agenda. I care about all people's. I care about everyone here, and this is difficult for them. This is a difficult shift. In fact, he says in his one-verse explanation, if you could put verse 32 up there for me, uh, he says in his one-verse one explanation, the word believe three times. John came to you, and you did not believe. Tax collectors and prostitutes did believe. But even when you saw like them responding, Palm Sunday, all this amazing turning to Jesus, even when you saw that, even then you still wouldn't believe that I was up to something special. So it's a believing problem for them. It's also a changing your mind. I don't know if you see that in the order too. Change your mind. You need to change your mind, which is actually what the first boy illustrates. It's both boys in a different way. But there's this changing of your mind. There's this believing and accepting what Jesus is saying, not what I want him to say, or maybe the way I want the kingdom to be. This has not gotten any easier for us, unfortunately, over the years. So when I began my studies, the, the scare tactic at the time in engineering, which I started in, was look to your left, look to your right, only one of the three of you is going to make it out of here. That was just sort of, and statistically, I think that was correct. That was how they did it. Now, if I had to sort of adapt that and twist it into like a Christianized version, I would say, if you're in the kingdom of God, if you're trying to take Jesus seriously, if you really want to follow him, it's a good chance if you look in the kingdom of God to your left 
and to your right, you're going to run into someone there you didn't expect. <laughs> There's going to be someone who may not look like you, think naturally, not have the same temperament. They may not like the same worship style. There's a chance they have different educational background. They may have done some things you haven't done. They may have not done things you have done. There's going to probably be somebody in the kingdom of God who's like, whoa, really? This is our kingdom, huh? And that's just how it works. And this was hard for them. And I don't think it's gotten all that much easier. Um, and so this is an appeal. I find it fascinating. Uh, John was calling these people. It says that John the baptizer, his, he was calling them to a baptism of repentance. Again, that's part of what Jesus is calling, repenting, changing your mind, and then coming on board with his agenda. But this is not a breakfast parable. It is a dinner parable. And confirmation is going to come in the vineyard later, in the kingdom uh, later. And so that's where you begin to think about what's going on here. I like that this sort of depicts how faith works for many people. Some people respond right away, and they just jump in, and they just kind of make a different. God, some people do that, but for a lot of folks, they have to hear it a little bit. And they kind of, mm, not sure. Not sure, Dad, if I'm doing that. <laughs> and then there's some that are like, oh, absolutely, but then within two or three weeks, there's, you know... It just, isn't it true how it just takes a little bit of time for some of this to play out in, in people's lives? Um, I don't know if I like that, but it's just the way it works. There's just a lag time between when you hear truth and sometimes when you decide that it's really worth thinking more about and actually believing and then following through on. There's just a lag time in that process. And the journey sometimes got some ups and downs and some push back and pull. I mean, that's just how this faith journey works. And you can see it in these two boys in this story. They're, they're, they're pushing and pulling in different directions. So in the story, there is an implied moment of decision. Again, I'm making this up, but let's just say it's 11 o'clock a.m. They made the decisions at breakfast, right? And somewhere after breakfast, but before the whole day, I mean, they still got a decent part of the day left. Somewhere in there, they rethink it. There's a later on. That's the later on in the story. And boy number one, the one who said absolutely not, must start thinking, hmm, you know, dad doesn't usually send me on s silly jobs. He doesn't usually waste my time and make me do things that I end up not benefiting from and that don't help anybody. And he just, dad doesn't usually do that stuff with me. Maybe I really ought to rethink my answer to him and working in the kingdom or the vineyard Somehow he comes up with a yes. He goes from a no to realizing, wait a minute, I might not have reacted right on that one. And he gets over to a yes. And then there's the other one. <laughs> and he, somewhere between saying yes and getting his boots and overalls or whatever you put on to go in a vineyard, somewhere between getting that actually worked out, this individual, I don't know. Does he get a text from friends? Whoa, we're all at the mall hanging out. You want to come? I there's a kind of movie I'd like to see. You know, I would, I would sort of enjoy doing it. I could use a nap. That was a big breakfast I ate. You know, I could probably relax a little bit. Tomorrow. What's it going to matter? We got tomorrow just good. I'll start working tomorrow. I don't know, but I do know that somehow he found a way to get out of what he had expressed and what he had been asked by his dad to do. He figures out a way to wiggle out, comes up with an excuse. He figures out something that allows him to get from yes to no. Interesting, huh? <laughs> That's where it can kind of get a little close to home sometimes to us. I, and in the story, see if I'm right on this. In the story, not, I mean, within the actual parable, you almost get the impression that the dad, the father, is going to walk out to the vineyard at the end of the day and be like, oh my goodness, I didn't expect you to be out here, son number one. But in reality, we know that's not true. The reason Jesus is telling the parable, he's not surprised by the pushbacks of people. He's not shocked by the false yeses. Of, he is telling this to help them through that. He's not actually stunned. He knows what's going on in people's hearts. He knows what's going on in their hearts. He knows what's going on in my heart. He has known that. He's not stunned by that. Lord, what he does want to do is make a legitimate appeal and invite them in. Come on, guy. Come on. 
this is where the kingdom's going. Come on. He's not just scolding them in the sense that you can never be a part of it. You've blown it. for No, they can. They're going to have to change. They're going to have to make some adjustments. But they can actually join. Isn't that great to know? I mean, at some level, it's exciting to think that Christ died for tax collectors and sinners and criminals and thieves and murderers. They're all over our Bible, by the way. Yes, praise God for that. He also died for uppity, arrogant, judgmental, religiously kind of overly self-confident people. Some of them also really come to faith. He died for them too. And he died for the regular run-of-the-mill disciple who, I, they're just, they get fearful, they get fickle, they're trying to follow, but they're not real good at the following thing. And I, he, he just did. That whole package is part of the kingdom. Uh, I just think that's so important for us to keep in mind, that somewhere along the way, you're going to have to let go of the kind of clenched fist, closed heart, we're only going to do it the way I think we should do it, God, and this is how it's going to happen. It's not. It's not going to happen that way. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to adapt to Jesus' way of the kingdom, um, and, it's, and it's not gotten necessarily any easier. So I've worked with young adults for decades, and it is really, really hard to tell on day one who's going to be interested in day 501. I've been doing this for a while. You'd think I'd be better at that. It's not easy because there's an important lag deal in there. It's not just me. Have you ever watched these athletic drafts? Unbelievable, the top picks, who are going to be surefire superstars. Sometimes not. They end up being busts. And there are late round picks who no one was really sure about. And it didn't even seem like it was worth bothering to pick them. And lo and behold, they end up being all stars and hall of famers and things. And you're going, whoa, how in the world did that happen? It's not about draft day. I mean, draft day is important, but this, this is about actual who's in at the end of the game and how's this thing playing out over the court. That's, that's the push of this parable here. Jesus is like, you're kind of missing it, but you can get in. You can get in. And these people got in early, which is great, but they're going to have to stay connected too. It, you can just feel the pull of him sort of doing that in there. So as a, I don't know, older person now, at least to the young adults I'm with, <laughs> they like to remind me of this, uh, it's harder to know sometimes how to respond to the objectors, the over-negative people. I mean, I got, it's like they need something different from me than the individuals who give the empty yeses. And I don't always know how. But I know that Jesus seemed to, and I like that he did. There's a verse in 1 Thessalonians where he's writing to that church, and he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and divisive, which is kind of what our parable is. He's warning some people who are being idle and divisive. The next thing that he says is, encourage the timid or comfort the brokenhearted. That would be like what Jesus does with Simon Peter, who was wildly overconfident in his ability. Oh, they'll all deny you, Jesus. Count me in, though. I'm not denying. I will be there through. And the story falls apart for him. But Jesus is so gracious with him in the restoration. It's very different how he handles him. And then it talks about helping the weak, being patient with everyone. It's hard to know exactly how that's going to work out in people's lives, but I, I want to get better at that. I hope you do too. And I've also found that the longer you live with the message of Christ being the answer, Christ being the one who can help you become your true self, Christ being the one who knows you better than you do, it actually wears well over the long haul. And sometimes it takes people a little while to figure this out. There's just something about wanting to run my own show that just seems great. But you run your own show for a little while, friends, and all of a sudden you start looking around, you're like, what have I done? I am not qualified to be God. How did I get here? Or I want to worship things or stuff, and I want to put the important in there. And over, after a while, you realize, oh, my gosh, this isn't going to do it. I need something for my soul. I need something. This is not adequate. This is not an adequate belief system. And I think most, well, all false belief systems end up coming to a point where they just sort of start disintegrating and falling apart. Whereas over time, Jesus is still there. Ooh, the, the love of God, the person of Jesus, they're durable. They wear well. The longer you look and the harder you press, sometimes you realize, oh, this guy's different. He made claims nobody else made. His life looks different. He's just different. How do I get closer to that person rather than worship the wrong one? 
And it's just how it plays out. So in this particular story, Jesus says, starts by asking, what do you think of these two sons? Or it could have been two daughters. Could have been an employer with two employees. Could have been a coach with two players. But he ends by asking, so which of them actually did his father's will? And they get it right. Oh, the one who actually made it out there is the one who did it. So it's a parable about being willing to shift and change and actually not what you initially got wrong, right? but how did you arrive? Where did you end up actually placing your vote on Jesus? Where did you actually end up concluding about him? And that's the push of this. And in the middle of it, he uses this word repent or change your mind several times. And so I want to say something about that as I close. Repentance, turning, turning directions to come to God is not something that only starts the Christian life. It is something that starts the Christian life. You cannot start the Christian life without turning to Christ. There is a turning to Christ that has to happen from me, from whatever I'm worshiping, from what I have to turn. I have to do that. But it's also partly how you continue in the Christian life. You have to continue to kind of repent and change things. It's the way in and it's the way forward. And so I heard a uh, retreat speaker one time. He was just getting a little carried away with himself. But this is what he said. He said, repentance is turning yourself completely around. Repentance is giving yourself to God 360 degrees. He meant to say 180. <laughs> uh, he, 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 meant, he meant this. But as anyone who speaks knows, we all say things that you're like, oh my gosh, I wish I hadn't said that. Way. But the funny thing on this one for me was I started thinking about it. And I was like, you know what? For a lot of us, a lot of the time, that is what it means. What am I doing? Oh, I got a little feeling. Oh, I'm back to where I was. Oh, I got a little something. Something pinged on my conscience. Something, oh, but I'm back to where I And you realize that's not... That's not repentance. That, that, that's, I don't know, doing a little twirl or something, you know. That's a pirouette for something. And it could have led to it, but it just didn't, you know. Uh, and, and so I just think there's this reminder that, and, and I would go so far as to say, sometimes the initial turning to Christ might be 180, but a lot of times for us, we don't get that far off. We're like 30 degrees off, you know. I just got to tweak that one little section of my life or maybe even 5 or 10% off. This is just one attitude I got. Oh, there's just one thing that Jesus is, there's one motivation. Ah, I got to pull that one back in. And that's part of what it means to grow up as Christians, is to keep doing that because we just need to be pulled back. So here's a quote I found from C.S. Lewis that I found interesting. And I'll read that as kind of my last idea on repentance. He's talking to people who were upset about like Christianity was not current enough. It wasn't up to date enough. It was too old. And so he comes to this point in, his, in, this, in this particular essay where he writes, we all want progress. But progress means getting nearer to the place where you want to be. That's important, by the way. And if you're taking a wrong turning, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. If you're on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. In that case, the man who returned soonest is the most progress-oriented person. And he gives an illustration about how if you're doing a math sum and you get off course, you need to go back where you've missed it. You can't just keep going on. Or if you're writing computer code and you found your error, you can't just keep building. You've got to go back and fix that. Or if you're building a house, you can't say, oh, we blew the foundation, but we're going to be good from floors two. No, you've got to go back. And, 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 and his push is that going back is going to be returning to an actual call by Christ. And so he finishes by saying it this way. There's nothing progressive or progress-oriented about being pig-headed and refusing to admit a mistake. And I think if you look at the present state of the world, it's pretty plain that humanity's been making some big mistake. We're on the wrong road, and it, it, if that is so, we got to go back. Going back is the quickest way to go on. I think that's a good reminder for us. It's true at a personal level, too. You know, sometimes I just got to, that's what it means to, to grow up. And so in this story, I don't know where you, some of us feel like we're probably late story. Some of us mid story. Some of us early. It's hard to know. We don't know how long we got. But I find myself when I read this story thinking, wouldn't it be great if that first boy had been a little more agreeable? That'd been nice, wouldn't it? Certainly have been nice for the parents. Or wouldn't it have been nice if the second child could rehabilitate and sort of make their way back out there after all? Uh, and I think that's the point. 
be that child. You, you, be, be, be the one that you know Jesus is calling us to be. That, that seems to be the push in this particular parable. And know that in order to do that, friends, you, me, all of us, in order to do that, we're going to have to continually repent sometimes and adjust to Jesus' call and cooperate with him and realign with him and let him be in charge of things. That's going to be part of what it means to grow up and keep going. That's just how it works as a Christian person. And I will add as my final thought, and remember, we're not ever going to get this fully right. There was one person who did get it fully right, though. There was one individual who actually said yes and then did the 100% yes. And it's him that we're talking about. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second as we take communion. But let, let me pray for us. Lord, help us to say yes to you. It's so easy to overreact to minor secondary things in our lives. And it's so easy to underreact or be indifferent to the things that really matter a lot. And that's where we need your help. We need you to keep calling us back to you, pulling us drawing us, showing us that you have your, our best in mind and you know what you're doing in the kingdom. So help us to re-participate and rejoin you in your kingdom if we're struggling, Lord. And I ask that you would do it in the name of the one who is just great at doing this, bringing people back, Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.